Dear Eve, good morning, uh, buongiorno, and all those other, hello in all those other European languages. Unfortunately, I don't know that well. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Eurovision conference. Uh, we have quite a jam-packed schedule to get through and we have a lot of speakers. So rather than me faff around, I'm going to get right to the point. I'm going to start by introducing uh, today's panelists who will be taking part over the next hour and a half in the various Eurovision discussions. Uh, just before I start into that, I'm Adrian Kadna from the Department of Geography in uh, Minuch University in the Republic of Ireland. So hello to everyone joining us from Ireland, but also hello to everyone joining us from outside of Ireland. Uh, this event is being organized by the Minuch University Social Sciences Institute. So thanks very much to them. And particularly thanks to Anne, as always for her help with the technological aspects of organizing this event. Without Anne, there would be no online conference. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to uh, the co-organizer today, Ms. Keelan Darcy, and then we're going to start talking to various members of the panel. So I'll hand over to Keelan, and what I suggest is we might talk to Johnny first. Uh, so we'll alternate. Uh, we'll go Keelan, Johnny, talking with Johnny, uh, Adrian talking with Louise, Keelan talking with uh, Connor, who's our debut uh, panelist this year, and I'll talk with Rebecca, and we'll see if Michael joins us at that stage. So uh, I'll hand over to Keelan, and Keelan will just introduce herself, and then she'll start off by talking with Johnny. So we're just going to introduce the panel quickly, because unfortunately we haven't allowed time for uh, too much today. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so just also uh, before we forget, please make sure to uh, get involved in the chat, ask any um, ask any questions that you have, and um, we may put it to the panel throughout. Um, you may not be able to contribute through voice, but if you could contribute through the comments, that'd be great, and be talking to one another. Um, so yeah, my name's Keelan, and um, I've been organising this event with Adrian for the past number of years. Um, it's always a very enjoyable event for me, particularly as a Eurovision fan. I think I got lucky once I met Adrian as the supervisor. Not only did we have a mutual love of elections, but we had a mutual love of uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, so I'm going to go first to Johnny Fallon uh, from Car Communications. So Johnny, you have been um, one of our, um, I don't know, I don't want to say like um, OAPs in, in the, <laughs> like, because even here, I feel like I'm an OAP. I'm getting that way now, Keelan, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I feel like it myself, it's just we're here every year. But um, Johnny, you're a massive fan of the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, what is Eurovision to you? Why is it important? I think it look for for many of us there's a there's a personal aspect to it that you know I think many people grow up with Eurovision you come from households and I think in Ireland in particular for many of us we we grew up at those times those years in the 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 late 70s early 80s when Ireland was always competing even if we weren't winning it we were you know coming first and second and third and we always had had a lot of good songs there was always great energy about Ireland at that stage going into the Eurovision song contest of course, part of that was that for, you know, at, at a personal level, it brings back all those memories, all those kind of ideas of family and sitting around and watching it and all the, the thrill of, of that. While we haven't been as successful over the years, I think it also reminds uh, those of us who are maybe from a generation ago um, as well that... Similar to what happened, I think, in Eastern Europe um, after the, the the fall of the wall, as many uh, the Berlin Wall and all that, as many of those countries came into Eurovision, Eurovision became a great way for countries to actually, you know, assert their nationalism in a nice way, assert themselves on the world stage. And in the 80s and early 90s, that was a big thing for Ireland, too. You know, um, we didn't have a whole lot. We could do big things as a country, but your vision was one of those where you went out and you stood toe to toe with all the countries in Europe and you might just win and you were part of something special. I think it, it, that changed over the years as Ireland grew a little bit wealthier, a little bit more confident and whatever. But now, I suppose, for me, your vision is still that great. It's just such an amazing contest, such an amazing coming together of cultures and people with no animosity really within them. They just want to go there and have a good time, a good party. And it's a little bit of fun and a little bit of cheese and some voting as well, which, uh, you know, is just wonderful. Thanks, Johnny. That always enjoyable talking to you about what your vision means to you. you. Always give a beautiful description of it. Um, so I'm going to pass back to Adrian now, um, who's going to go on to Louise, as far as I'm aware. Um, so Adrian, whenever you're ready. 
On well to on show, Adrian. With connecting to audio. I think we lost him for a second, but he's just yeah. back. Grand. Oh. Thanks, Anne. Adrian, can you hear us? Oh, you just have to unmute yourself, Adrian. Apologies. I'm having technological problems. Uh, I'll let you. Yeah, no, no problem at all. So, Louise, I'll go on to you, <laughs> um, if that's okay. Um, so, Louise, um, the last time we had you, um, you were running your blog, and now you've started a podcast with a fellow panelist as well. Um, so, you're massively into your vision. Um, what actually I've been recommending your podcast to my class and your Twitter page. I'm like, you need to follow her. She's excellent. So what inspired you to actually start the um, blog and get that involved in the Eurovision Song Contest? Uh, well, hi, Keelan. Thanks for having me again. It's nice to, to chat again. I love this time of year and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose you could say I've just been truly bitten by the bug <laughs> of Eurovision and all of the things that Johnny alluded to there in his description of Eurovision are so many of the reasons why I love it and the friendships you can make around it, the trips you can go on, the different experiences you can have um, as, as well of course as the music um, are all of the different things that have drawn me kind of closer and closer in and led me to making content and so on. So yeah, I had done a lot of work with the YouTube channel Eurovision Hub for the last few years. Um, I haven't been as involved of late, but a little bit of behind the scenes work. Um, Connor, a, a dear friend, a neighbor of mine also happens to be a Eurovision fan. And we were sitting over the, a, a gin and tonic or something last summer chatting all things Eurovision. And the conversation sort of came up of how of late um, with the emergence of so many Irish fans um, that there was almost a gap that there wasn't kind of anywhere for Irish fans per se to go for, you know, latest news or updates or just sort of coverage of Eurovision from a strictly Irish perspective. There's a huge interest out there. Like we see it now when we go to the there's a, a fan club, OJ Ireland, and that has been really back up and running in the last year or two. We're seeing it at events now that the pandemic has kind of gone away. We're seeing it at the national finals, pre-parties, different things that we're, we are able to attend. And even just the messages um, coming in from so many fans saying, oh, I didn't realise there was this many fans out there. I didn't realise the interest was there. So it has been really eye-opening, I think, for, for Connor and I, just to see the, the huge, vast interest that is definitely still there in Ireland for Eurovision. And thank you so much, Louise. And I'm going to go on to Connor next, um, your fellow podcaster. Um, so Connor, uh, welcome firstly to um, our Eurovision conference, your first time on the Eurovision conference. Um, but we're delighted to have you. I was very excited to see that you're part of the panel. Um, Connor, so is this podcast, Eurovision, is this the first time you like since you've been like, is this your first sort of like media involvement as such with um, the the Eurovision Song Contest? Prior to this, were you just a massive fan? Well, firstly, thank you for having me. I've been virtually watching these conferences for the last few years. So it's great to actually be a part of it, uh, finally. So thank you. Um, yeah, Eurovision has been something like Louis said that we felt that you know needed to happen. I guess because there was that kind of gap in the market. Um, but for me personally, I kind of dipped my toe into different things. Um, at, at university, I just kind of did um, a Eurovision show on the radio station there. So, and that was successful in itself. Um, we had a lot of people tuning in within the university and online uh, through like the catch-up system. So yeah, there was always like an interest there, but prior to that, I hadn't really done anything. Um, it was just kind of a a secret fan I guess because like Lou said I didn't really realize there was so many fans out there um you know it's kind of that niche subject that you don't really talk about you can't really say that you like it so I guess you know this podcast has really shown me how many fans are out there and you know probably how many fans we we haven't even heard from yet you know what I mean so it just shows you the popularity of the contest still to this day despite our results at the moment so yeah Thank you so much, Connor. Uh, your podcast is excellent. You and Louise's Thank podcast, you. just keeping us all up to date on the Eurovision going on, and your interviews have been excellent. Um, but I, I'm going to go on to Rebecca next. 
So Rebecca, um, we had you last year. Um, mm -hmm. You are a fellow, just massive Eurovision fan. You've attended the Eurovision Song Contest. I what did, I, yeah. um, and had a fantastic time. You gave us some good tips and tricks to attend in, if you were to attend the Eurovision Song Contest. But um, I suppose, what for you is the most memorable moment of the Eurovision Song Contest? Um, I don't know if it's a, a memorable moment of the contest, but what kind of like shaped my love of Eurovision? Um, I'm kind of like of Johnny's vintage and I remember the, you know, like the, you know, the mid 80s, the 87 is the defining kind of memory for me. And I was in, I think, senior infants, I was about five. And I remember having a conversation with like fellow five-year-olds in school. And we were talking about the Eurovision and I was saying how Turkey got nil point that year. That was the year we won. And first of all, they were like, Turkey, that's a food. And I'm like, no, 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 it's a country and they got nil point. And like how precocious was I at five? But anyway, um, and then they were like, Eurovision, what's that? And I'm like, here I am in senior infants. I was like, I haven't found my tribe. You are not my people. And then everywhere I've kind of gone through life, I've like, as Connor said, like it's like a secret club that you kind of like, you look at each other and you're like, are you? And then, then you kind of collect all your Eurovision people along the way. So like, it's not, like, I've loads of Eurovision moments. Um, like, you know, like Lorene Euphoria, uh, Lena Satellite, all of these are the ones that kind of stand out for me in recent years. But it's more of like a feeling of like this time of year, like it is the most wonderful time of the year that you're allowed to talk about your interest and express your interest um and yeah unfortunately my my tips and tricks for going to the Eurovision this year and um, I flights and accommodation but I've no tickets and um, Liverpool just yeah it just I don't think they really got their act together this year and um, and I think they probably let let their fans down but having said that that hasn't tainted it for me and obviously I'm always going to be a huge fan yeah oh god it's a pity hopefully you get tickets anyway there was actually a question there anyone for Liverpool so you have your flights book but no no tickets. I have on. my flights. I've done the whole accommodation malarkey, accommodation cancelled, accommodation rebooked, all of that kind of thing. Um, but you know what? I'm I'm as happy to stay at home and and watch it with my tribe at home. Yeah, I am. Um, I I my brother's wedding was supposed to take on at that weekend, but um, they ended up having a baby instead. But um, I'm a bit annoyed at them because I could have booked flights over. Thought be a nice present for myself but um anyways look I suppose not not getting tickets that uh, people aren't getting tickets I, I suppose I can't be angry but too stressed about that um, it's, just, so, it's annoying because it's so close that you know yeah like, oh, very close half oh, an hour yeah. flight like amazing um Let's swim yeah. over yeah <laughs> you can I'll <laughs> I'll get the boat <laughs> um, you can have my flights thank you <laughs> but one person who is going to Liverpool is Michael Keeley and um, so Michael is another stalwart he is the um he is the head of the Irish delegation for RT um so thank you again Michael for coming always interesting chats with you also um you um and you bring a further perspective to the Eurovision Song Contest because you are directly involved with the Irish process and um, how has that job been for you and um, because I have seen myself a complete I don't know I've seen it grow and grow every year um, and it made changes so how has that job been for you? Um, to be honest it's getting in, like it's getting busier and busier every year and um, it's getting to the point now where <clears throat> I don't think it's you know one person can actually do it and do it justice and do all the other things that RT asked me to do in here as well um at the same time now I mean look I'm not complaining about my lot you know I mean I think I have a great job I think it's a it's a fantastic privilege to be able to work in in this organization but there are I mean you know when I when I go away uh to Eurovision meetings or whatever I mean I was at one in Liverpool there in in March and uh, I'm talking to my colleagues like the Finns for instance I was talking to the Finnish delegation who would be quite friendly with and they were saying they do nothing else all year like there was three of them at the meeting there was only one of me you know what I mean so that was just, just gives you an idea of how other countries approach this competition um they they work on nothing else other than their selection process and Eurovision all year round uh you know I've said this before and I say I'm not I'm not complaining but I like I do other things I do the St Patrick's Day Parade I do New Year's Eve I do the Rosa Trilly I do whatever else I'm working on the Joe Biden visit this week so as soon as this is over now uh, you know there's, there's a whole um day ahead of me of um Joe in Ballina um to take care of 
So uh, it, it's, it's increasingly difficult to uh, do the Eurovision justice, to be perfectly honest. I think we need to, um, look, you know, RT is no secret, we've needed to, to up our game in this area for a long, long time. I'm, I've been doing my best to push, uh, to push the cause and um, to fight the good fight from, from within. But it it's it always comes down to the same old story, you know. I mean, we 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 just don't have resources or finances to allow somebody like me to do nothing but Eurovision, uh, you know, uh, on a full time basis. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is at the moment. And until that changes, um, you know, I I I just think that um that we're we're always going to um be the the poor relation at Eurovision. Yeah, well, like I can see, you can see the potential that Ireland could do, like, you know, that, like, it's we good to see do. some sort of an encourage, like, it's good to have someone there that sees what Ireland could potentially do, have have the, re the resources, and for me anyways, maybe other people um are different, but I've seen anyways a change in the year vision, yeah, okay, I agree that there are changes that need to occur, but I do also recognise that resources, we don't have the resources that other countries have, but it is excellent to see um like um a change like i've heard wild youth song on the radio a few times which is good to well, bring you the, you know what? that that was also the the culmination of not just like a couple of weeks or a couple of months but that's years of work trying to persuade people within this organization to actually get behind our song you know and i think um you know last year there was there was i thought you know not great support of brooks song uh, on the radio despite it being I thought quite a very radio friendly song, but you know, there's there's still unfortunately, um, there's still it's it's changing, but there's still a, a, an attitude, um, not just in in RT, but throughout the the music industry and the radio industry in Ireland, that Eurovision is you know is is not a serious competition, it's not a serious music, um, forum, and um, I think that's that's changing, but it's it's slow process trying to persuade people. Definitely is. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, you sound like a very busy man, especially this week with Joe Biden about. <laughs> um, so I don't want to give the impression that I'm solely looking after Joe Biden. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think not. you're babysitting him. <laughs> no, nothing. Um, well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, so that concludes just introducing the panel. So we're going to go, Adrian, are you OK to do your uh, session? I think next? if you can hear me, Keelan, I can talk, but you won't see me. That's grand. Yeah, no can hear you perfectly, so I can. Um, so Adrian, every year he discusses voting patterns. He does a wee bit of a um a presentation. Um, so this is the next section of our um conference. Um, so I'll hand you over to Adrian. Uh, do I see there's a few con uh questions coming in there? Um, we will get to them at a later point uh, when we go back to the panel. And um, so do keep uh, contributing and have discussions amongst one another within the comments too. Thank you. Uh, hi, I, I'm not sure people can hear me. Uh, I can't, unfortunately, do the presentation today because all just before the conference started, or as you might see, Zoom suddenly uninstalled on my laptop, so I, I'm using the phone. So rather than me uh, talk today, I think I'm going to throw it back to the panel because uh, we have to a lot of time and I don't want to waste people's time with my technological issues. So I'm just wondering uh, the panel's opinion on this. Uh, one, there's a lot of talk this year about the big voting changes that are impacting on, in relation to this year's Eurovision semi-finals. So for those of you who don't know, this year the main changes are we've gone back to 100% televoting uh, for this year's semi-final. It was 50-50 jury televoting roughly for the last 10, 11, 12 years. And this year we have the addition of a rest of the world uh, vote as well. So I know a lot of Keelan students are interested in this. I'm just wondering uh, what the panel's discussion opinions are in terms of how this might impact this year's semi-finals. Uh, I think in terms of Ireland semi-final, I think we've probably seen the impact of it. Uh, there's not that many valid entries. I think some countries are being very strategic about picking entries they think will get them out of the semi-final in the telephone. But anyway, I'll shut up and let the panel Give their opinion. So maybe we'll go to Connor first, and uh, panel members feel free to jump in whenever you want on this. 
I think the, the the addition of the rest of the world is probably a great thing because, of course, you know, we know Eurovision is such a global event now. We have people tuning in from all around the world. So I guess it's it's nice to hear their input into the contest now. Um, but in terms of, you know, getting rid of the juries for the for the semifinals, I think it's slightly hypocritical. You know, we, we're saying we trust them for the, the grand final, but we don't trust them for the semifinals. So I don't know. I think, you know, based on last year, there was obviously a big change needed in terms of juries because, you know, we've known that there's slight shenanigans going on for the last few years when it comes to juries. Um, is getting rid of them totally the answer? I'm not too sure. I think maybe expanding that jury uh, was maybe a better option. Potentially, you know, having a, a proper vetting service, you know, when it comes to selecting jury members for each country, you know, a strict criteria that people have to have to kind of um stick to getting rid of them i'm not too sure i i hope we don't kind of venture back into the you know late 2000s of eurovision you know these jokey entries you know it's great to have a bit of fun but you know if we're getting into these kind of politically driven entries just you know to to get a few televotes i'm not too sure that's the the way we want to go back to those days because the contest has been doing you know the standard of the contest over the last few years has been so so good you know 2021 any of the songs really in my opinion could have probably won any other year with the standard that they were at so yeah i i i, I want to see it play out this year but i'm not too sure going forward is it is it necessarily the best option getting rid of the juries uh johnny what's your take on this yeah, I think it's it's it, it would be interesting to see how it plays out uh, among the, the the votes this year. I think it's an interesting experiment for them to do because we did have that um, you know purely public vote uh, before. We weren't happy with it, particularly some of the the legacy nations, shall we call them, like Ireland, weren't happy with it, and we kind of said, oh, you know, this is ruining it and its popularity. In fact, the public vote very often, you know, we felt it was people felt that it was leading into block voting and all this. But actually, as it's gone back into 50-50, we've had just as many complaints now about the jury side of it, the jury vote. I think the impact of it, um, of doing it, ultimately, uh, and you know, Adrian, before, I've often talked about how, you know, because I love your vision, it's impossible to avoid some songs. But at one point, I used to listen to every song, so as I'd know every song going into it. And then over the last few years, I've started going, no, I'll, I'll hear the ones that I can't avoid here and I can't resist hearing. But other than that, trying to just wait till the night and hear it, because your view of what's a winner and what's not utterly changes if you only hear it once. And the thing is, the slow burner songs, they can go with with juries or people who are informed or people who are thinking about trends. The thing about it is with purely public voting, you have to have an outstanding song, not just a good song that goes to any kind of formula. It has to be outside the formula. It has to be something that you remember either for the stage, for the beat, for the singer, for the theme it's about. And it has to really stand out from the crowd in order to get that. Otherwise, you just risk people going, well, I vote for that song that stood out. And then I vote for my neighbor's songs. So neighbors do get through in public votes because cultural ties and so on. But the winning song will always be a standout song. I think for me, the winning song in Eurovision will always be a good winner, no matter what voting system you've got. Problem is, we're all obsessed with getting out of semifinals and whether or not we're just in the final or, you know, but what the public vote will certainly do is, as Connor mentioned, there could be a return to the joke kind of entries and that because it does promote risk. It does promote the idea of whatever you do, you might get null point or you might win it. It's hard to know, but go for risks, go for things that are off the scale that people aren't going to expect. Uh, it has to be faster or slower or your own language or another language, whatever, but you can't really predict it. And it just has to catch the zeitgeist, not only of the time, but of the night, on the moment, on stage. So that does make it a little bit tougher. Uh, Louise, uh, what's your opinion? Uh, I'll actually just change it around a bit. Louise, what's your opinion on this introduction of the rest of the world vote? And how might you see this panning out for this year's contest? Uh, Connor touched on it, and I agree that I really welcome the, the rest of the world vote, I think. There has been international interest in the Eurovision Song Contest for such a long time. But we can see it online as well. Fans from all over the globe, people travel from all parts of the world to attend the event. So I think it's fantastic to include them. 
Uh, also, interestingly, we have to consider that, you know, this is potentially Australia's last year. We're looking forward to possibly Asia Vision actually uh, coming together. There's been talk of it for many years, but it's looking like it, it could be in the pipeline for the next year or two. And Australia may hop over to that. So I think this is kind of building on that international platform that um, has been taking shape for, for Eurovision for a long time. And we also see it within the actual music, within the songs that, you know, we often talk about cultural influences on music and folk music doing well and, and so forth. But then there's the other side where, you know, th there has been an increase in music being sent that's appealing to the masses. And I would be very interested to see how it plays out in terms of, for example, with Spain sending, you know, such a um, close to the bone song and um, so, so cultural and something that only really Spain could send, how, you know, the influence of a potential Latin America vote could push them up the rankings and so forth. Um, it will be, it'll be very, very interesting to see how it plays out. But I, I welcome the inclusion. I think it, it might throw a, a few surprises in and maybe a spanner in the works in, in terms of the results. So it's, it's always good to have something new and exciting to chew on. Uh, Michael, uh, now I've crunched the numbers since 2016 and on average, Ireland's actually, I think the perception was when the juries came back, given how well we'd done in the 1990s with jury only voting, uh, I think the perception was we'd probably do quite well, but it's not really been the case. I know Neve Kavanagh was helped by the jury in 2010, Jedward Slight in 2011, and Molly Sterling would have qualified in 2015 if it had been only jury voting, but by and large and average, we've been doing slightly better with the televote. Uh, how do you think this new voting system will help or hinder Ireland? Uh, do you think the rest of the world vote might help us with maybe Irish diaspora, members of the Irish diaspora voting, or maybe it won't, maybe it's just buzz? Um, to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure how it's going to impact on our um, on our results. I, one, of, one of the things, it, it, they actually don't make it easy if you're in the rest of the world to vote. You have to vote with a credit card. So you have to actually verify the fact that you're not within one of the countries that are in the semi-final or in the competition. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be a deterrent to people to, um, to, to want to get involved. So I don't know how... Uh, many people, I mean, you know, will 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 take up the offer of of, um, of voting in the rest of the world. Uh, I, I mean, just to say, to, to to kind of touch on what Louise was saying, it is reflective of the way the competition is going. Um, it is the the biggest music event in the world, you know. So it's not just a European thing; it's a worldwide uh, event. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, I'm not sure um, if it's going to successfully um, be able to replicate sort of success that we've had in, in Eurovision in Asia or in America indeed. I think the, the American song contest kind of got off to a very, very shaken start um, the last couple of years. So I don't I think that's going to be parked for a while. Um, but like there's there's no, you know, you're an expert on voting, Adrian. There's no perfect voting system, as you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, on balance, I think if you've got juries you know they're they're always going to be prone to um to to outside influences or to their own inherent biases or whatever that's just, that's true of, of televote as well so there's uh, you know i don't know I, there's no there's no perfect system um i think the televote i think after last year you know the fact that they the ebu acknowledged the fact that there were six countries in our semi-final that they detected irregular voting patterns in. Like that's very concerning for anybody in the competition because that, how can you have an honest chance if you're up against juries that have been bribed or paid for by other countries? And, you know, it's not just last year. I've heard since I sort of first got involved in this competition really in, in 2013, there's always been rumors and um, suggestions of uh, jury tampering going on. And, you know, we all know where they're coming from, but nobody can prove, nobody can prove definitively that that's the case. But I just think the fact that the European, the EBU um, acknowledged it last year, I think is maybe a first step towards 
trying to tackle a very, very thorny subject, really. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I have my own issues with the juries as well, but I'll keep my own opinions to myself and let other people get their say. Um, here's a question for the panel. Uh, and I'll move to the people who haven't who haven't checked in with for a while first. Uh, what recent rule change in your vision would you like to see overturned, or what rule change would you like to see brought in for your vision? So, I'll start with I have my opinions about the running order, but I'll come back to that later. I'll start with Rebecca first. Is there anything in the rules at the moment you'd like to see changed, or any of the recent rule changes you think no, no? That's a bad thing. How about we bring back the compulsory orchestra? Because that's when Ireland did really well. Um, I, I don't like. I always think that we can we can skew it that you know, if you know if we're not doing well, it's because of a certain rule is hampering us or that you know we, we can always kind of make it make it fit or um, you know make it fit uh, you know whatever kind of um whatever way we're we're trying to see it. I I don't know. Um, the jury, the the voting, the jury voting will be interesting now to see. I think, um, the impact of fandom, um, is huge. You mentioned that you crunched the figures since twenty sixteen, um, if I'm not mistaken, twenty sixteen was the first of the pre parties and all that. So the big kind of like Eurovision circuit, um, where people are really exposed to the songs so far in advance. Whereas like Johnny mentioned, it's impossible to, to avoid the songs um, so far in advance. Um, so I think that, you know, I don't know, do you, do you get rid of the fun parties? You know, do you, you know, are you real purist? Um, I, I don't know what I'd like to see overturned or reintroduced. Um, but yeah, a, a, a shakeup needs to happen. And maybe that's going to happen now with the voting this year. Um, I'd like that excitement on the night, you know, the excitement that we had back in, you know, you know, the 80s and 90s and that, that it was like, you really didn't know what way it was going to go. Um, and I suppose it's going to be very difficult to get that excitement back because we have all the media influence now that we didn't have back in, in the good old days. Right, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I'll skip to Johnny first because I know Johnny has to leave early. Johnny, any rule changes you'd like to see scrapped or any rule change, new rules you'd like to see brought in? Um, well, I suppose the most famous rule change in, in my mind, again, if we went to Ireland, I think the thing that impacted us most uh, in Ireland was actually um, on, on, on the language um, that you had to sing in your, and we, we were only us in the UK really sang in English. Uh, and I think that was a huge advantage that was often not appreciated that you automatically, your song, now it doesn't have to be uh, an English song that wins every year, but I think it helps in a huge amount of years that it, it lets the song travel but of course i wouldn't actually want that it reimposed it's just a biased view from ireland that it helped us in the past i do think look i what i'd say to you about rules um it's very difficult it's something like your vision is is you know it's got its own momentum it's going in a direction it's going in the direction people want the public right and you try put rules and things around it it's always and i think you know it's like you're never going to get rid of public voting because public voting is now part of it so it's never going back to the old system you're never going backwards you're only going forwards and the, the market will decide everything will decide I think, you know, in one way, as, as a voter, uh, what I would love, Adrian, is if somehow we could all have a single transferable vote uh, in this and we could uh, give our list of preferences and go down it. But I think uh, outside of Ireland, again, that a lot of voters might struggle voting 10 and uh, having eliminations out of that uh, as, as to where the votes actually end up. But what I would also think maybe is going to happen, I think the you mentioned the rest of the world vote coming in. The hunger for countries to join, the demand for people to be part of what is this amazing festival, I think will only grow um, like it has in Australia and like it's growing in other countries. And it is getting, we have two semifinals. I think the competition will only grow and grow with other countries looking to come in, looking to have a part of it. I would say in the future, we are probably looking at, if you looked at something like football, where you have qualifying groups and you have people having to come out at three or four or five teams in groups and then compete, that will probably be down to something like that before you ever get to the finals. And then in the finals, coming out at smaller groups rather than everything in two big semifinals, trying to beat, you know, 20 nations to, to get out. 
it's getting unwieldy and just so big on the night that I think eventually we're going to have to break it down into smaller parts to get a manageable final uh, uh, eventually. So, you know, I think that's just reality of, of where the contest is going. Thanks, Johnny. Um, Louise, uh, what's, I'm going to talk about the running order. Uh, now, as you all know, since 2013, uh, we haven't had a draw for the running order. Okay, countries draw to be in either semi-final one or semi-final two. But ultimately, with as few small exceptions, the running order is generally decided by the show producers. Uh, this, now, this is one of my personal bugbears. I think it brings in an element of unfairness. Uh, I had maps to look through this today, and unfortunately, I've had the technical issues. But uh, looking at which countries tend to get the breaks or not get the breaks with the running order, it generally tends to be the smaller countries that are more likely to get the really bad running orders. Uh, for a few examples, Albania got the worst running order position you can get is number two in the running order. And Albania got that position two finals in a row, 2019 and 2021. Uh, the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Moldova, the Czech Republic, all have generally done worse in the running order decisions than others. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, uh, is a country that's been I think five times it's got a running order position between 10 and 13, which is basically uh, the best running order positions you can get if you're drawn to perform in the first half. So my person, like I've said this to the students in the loop before, the one thing I would like to change is bring back the draw because I think the running order, the producer decided running order, it just brings in an element of unfairness. And to quote uh, a, a famous uh, Irish hurling manager, David Fitzgerald, it's generally the smaller fish that lose out with the running order. I don't know if, does anyone else have issues with the running order? I can see the merits that's often offered to make sure that you have up-tempo songs after ballad songs. But I think last year's final you saw, what happens if a whole pile of ballads get drawn in the second half? You're going to have a, a long run of ballads in the middle of the contest. So. I don't know, uh, maybe it's not a big issue for you, Louise, but what's your opinion on the running order? I, I can understand how a lot of people feel that way, Adrian. And at times I do feel that the, the running order can skew results um, in, in a certain way. The, the chaotic part of my mind maybe would love it to go back to randomized order just kind of to see how it would it would all pan out and and who would make it into the final and who would get good results then in the final the other part of me from a, a show and enjoyer point of view i i do think it gives a nice cohesiveness to the shows when you know you kind of have um a very upbeat song followed by a slower song you have a palate cleanser in the middle of uh, a lot of chaotic or noisy songs um i don't ever really see it going back purely from a logistical point of view just um from an actual production perspective the stagings and the different things that go on these days on the eurovision stage are only getting more advanced with technology with creativity you only have to think of uh, an entry like a kate miller heike in 2019 for Australia and that huge stick that she was propelled from and kind of the organization involved to get something like that successfully onto the stage, have the artist safely on the equipment moving around. And then you've got the whole issue of the removal of the prop or whatever it is. So there's a, a lot of those elements and moving parts that go into a show and, and almost why the producers need to step in and say, well, OK, Australia therefore needs to come before a break or after a break. And, you know, Ireland doesn't have a, a huge amount on the stage, so it makes sense to put them on afterwards or whatever it, it might be. So a little bit like the, the the voting, I don't think running order is something that will ever be perfect and it's always going to hurt somebody, um, unfortunately. But there are very interesting stats now out there. Like it's amazing what what people are doing online. I'm thinking of um, a blog, Aussie Vision in particular, had a really good article several weeks ago with kind of all the statistics of 
um, each running order slot and the the percentage, the chance of, of each country qualifying is interesting. And, you know, for us here in Ireland, we were given slot six this year. And I do think a lot of us were surprised. We we did think with we are one, that whole team, we will probably be on first opening the, the first semi-final and opening Eurovision and we were given slot six, but I thought maybe the BBC are trying to do us a little bit of a solid, um, you know, as, as neighbours and Liverpool being such an Irish city, I'm sure it'll be a great home crowd. So there's something like a 6% higher chance we can qualify from, from slot six than slot one. So you're right, Adrian, there is a, an element of favours that can be given um, or unfavourable positions as well to countries. Yeah, just to pick up on one, number two uh, in the running order for semi-finals, since 2013, since the producer decided running order was brought in in 2013, uh, only four countries have qualified in position number two, so that's a 22% qualification rate. If you take out Nathan Trent uh, for Austria, Brigitte for Estonia, who qualified but would because they got boost from the jury, if it had been only based on televoting alone, only two entries, uh, Mikhail Spack, uh, Poland 2016, which you might remember was that song that came from nowhere to finish third in the televoting final, and then Genealogy for Armenia in 2015. So, yeah, it's interesting. Whereas, on the other hand, the last two positions in the semi final running order, they're almost like the Willy Wonka golden ticket. Uh, just for this year's contest, I was kind of looking on the Netherlands as slightly vulnerable because I said, okay, it's a good song, but it's a slow song. It mightn't get too many televotes. But uh, if you're putting second last in the winning order, you suddenly go from dodgy qualifier to probable qualifier. So, yeah, I still, I know I can see Louise's rationale there, but still for me, uh, I think the winning order is, mm, it brings in an element of unfairness. And I, I still personally think some form of draw would be better. Uh, just before Johnny goes, because I know Johnny has to go soon. Johnny, what's your take on the running order? Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Adrian. I think, um, you know, it's one of those things that for the vast majority of people who will sit down and watch your vision, outside of those of us who are, are, are your vision nerds, if you like, for the vast majority of people will sit down, they will look at it and just see the songs coming on and that's it. And we presume everything is, you know, completely above board and we see all of the, 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 the you know, how it's being run and everything in the background. Uh, but I think for most people, if you actually sat them down and then talked to them about that and said, well, the producer decides the running order and there are certain positions that are really bad in it. I think everyone gets that. Everyone would say, well, yeah, it makes sense that you don't want to be in that position or you're likely to forget a song here or forget a song there. And the idea that that can then be picked or you can choose what countries you might like, you know, even down to the fact that that as 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 we said there that maybe the UK maybe they're doing us a solid by by uh, uh, putting us in, in in one position, even the fact that we can say that introduces again just these accusations that it's not quite above board, that certain countries can be favoured, certain things. And I, I agree with you, Adrian. I do think it's something that we, we the more of that we can just get rid of, the better. That said, I also understand just from a TV production piece that if the random order just throws up a terrible order, size, you don't want people at home going, oh, I'm bored with this and I'm switching it off because I've just got like too many of this. So there has to be some element of of merging those two systems again and, and getting some sense of where they are in, in the order. But Ultimately, I think as long as you have countries and producer able to decide it a hundred percent, then you're going to have you're going to have accusations of favoritism always, and that's not a good thing. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, now, before I hand over to Keelan to chair the last parts of the last session, and thanks to Johnny, we might be hearing from Johnny again. So, thanks to Johnny for joining. I'm just going to read some of the chat. So, I'll uh, thanks to everyone. You can add comments in the chats. I won't read out the full chats, but I'll kind of just summarize. Uh, Keen, uh, Keen Jones asks, would RT ever consider having the Euro song on its own? Uh, Dennis O'Rourke suggested that maybe uh, you could relaunch the Castle Bar song contest and hold it in January and use that as a vehicle for uh, selecting Ireland's Eurovision song. Probably similar to what Spain's actually done. 
uh, maybe I don't know but with Benidorm best in recent years. Nathan Cassidy has suggested that uh, Moldova could win uh, semi-final one uh, due to the voting system. I actually like Moldova's entry this year. Uh, Conrad Brunstrom suggests that the one thing that last year proved is that you have to perform in the night. The bookies loved Italy last year, but the underwhelmed when it really counted. It remains a live event, which is part of its excitement. And Sean Young, uh, this is probably more a question than a comment, asks, has there been any proof that there may be certain favorite to, them, to some countries? Uh, so there are the chats. Uh, and before I hand over to Keelan, uh, some questions. We may come, you know what, there's questions from Karen and Shane. We'll probably, the best thing might be to come back to the questions in the last few minutes and use those at the end. So Karen and Shane will come back to your questions. I'll hand over to Keelan. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so yeah, we'll come back to the questions. So I have them up here anyways. Um, so in the last few minutes of this session, I might ask a couple of them if we have a bit of time. Um, I can see that it's about resources um, with regards to how people host the, uh, to select their uh, act for the Eurovision. And then there's another question about the rest of the world vote. So we'll be coming back to the topics we previously um, touched on. So if you have any questions related to them, feel free to ask further questions on them and we'll hopefully get to as many as possible. Um, so what I really want to ask now is that we're uh, getting on to the topic. So we've discussed about the voting changes, but another kind of um, I don't I don't know if it's like a new thing or like because it uh, like it had to happen is the fact that the United Kingdom are hosting despite not winning it last year. So it's kind of a fusion contest this year between Ukraine and um, the United Kingdom. So um, I think I want to go to Connor first with regards to this. Um, so Connor, how do you think this year's contest is going to pan out? Um, as, as this type of contest where it's um, the United Kingdom hosting it, but Ukraine winning it. And um, so how do you think they're going to find that balance um, this, in this year's contest? Um, I, I think it's going to be brilliant. I think it's, you know, the what we've heard so far about the contest, the plans that, you know, are in place and the staging and everything like that. I think it's going to be fantastic. I think the BBC are one of those broadcasters that know how to do large scale events. We've seen it, you know, the Olympics and everything between that. So I think we can trust them. Um, you know, it's it's crazy to think two, three years ago, who would have thought that the UK would have been hosting Eurovision? Um, you know, they were just so far behind. And it just shows you that such a simple attitude change can catapult you into doing so well at the contest. So I think the contest this year will have to strike that balance because, of course, you know, it is Ukraine's victory from last year. And I think the BBC are doing a fantastic job in, in that so far. Um, and I, yeah, I think we we heard the interval acts uh, for the semifinals announced yesterday. And, and again, it struck the balance between UK acts and uh, Ukrainian acts. So I think that, you know, the, the, the shows will be will be a fantastic view of the UK and Ukrainian communities, um, you know, because as we know, so many Ukrainians have had to, you know, leave leave their country and and start a new life in in the UK and of course Ireland. So I think that we'll see a lot of that throughout the show, whether it's postcards, uh, little mini kind of clips during the ad breaks. And um, so yeah, I think it, they'll they'll get it right. I trust the BBC when it comes to things like this. I I just I just feel like they're gonna they're gonna hit the right tone. Um, and yeah, even even with the hosting lineup as well some interesting names amongst them, you know, between U Ukraine and UK. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a, one of the, one of those shows that we'll remember for years to come, I reckon. Thanks, Connor. And Rebecca, um, as a fan of Eurovision, um, when Ukraine won last year, did you think the United Kingdom was the, when there was kind of whispers about Ukraine not hosting it due to the current situation, um, did you think, do you, in your opinion, do you find that the United Kingdom was the perfect alternative or did you think that someone else should have hosted it yeah no absolutely it was there was in my eyes it was the only alternative really um so much so that I like booked accommodation in like you know six different cities to make sure that I had it all like you know shored up but um I think when Connor said like you need someone like the BBC someone who you know they're used to large-scale events and someone who's going to handle it with like sensitivity as well um, and yeah no I've I've yeah I was it, 
it, it just made sense. Um, and I think looking at the little vignettes and the postcards and that that were kind of like um, launched or leaked or whatever you want to say this week. Yeah, it is. It's it's going to do it um, a really nice, going to do a really nice job. And it's, it's going to do it justice, I think. And as Connor said, it's going to be a memorable one for, for years to come. Thank you, Rebecca. And just to get on to the United Kingdom, um, Lou, I might ask you this question. So um, I've been quite vocal with my opinion on the United Kingdom um, and the acts that they were sending pre previously uh, pr to last year. I was a big fan of last year's um, entry of massive fan of Sam Ryder. Um, but I don't know about you. I'm kind of seeing a change in the way that the United Kingdom is approaching the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, what like, do you recognise this change? Do you think there's been a change with the attitude towards the Eurovision Song Contest um, in the United Kingdom? And what do you think sparked this change or didn't spark this change? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been really impressed with, with the kind of the trajectory the United Kingdom has been on. You know, I think they just decided that the, what they were doing wasn't, wasn't working, essentially. and you know, there's kind of that saying it's uh, stupidity is trying the same thing again and again and wondering why you're not getting different results. So I always almost feel for James Newman, the 2020 and 2021 act, because unfortunately, as we know, he his results weren't great in, in the contest, but he nearly was like the, the sacrificial lamb, kind of that first person in the new wave of the UK, you know, working with tap records um, just saying, let's get what we can behind us. Uh, let's get an artist who, you know, has a bit of pedigree behind them, has a bit of social media presence, has songwriting experience, all of those different elements. Um, they really, I think they tried with the staging and that and it, it didn't work out. And uh, just really the, the, the change we saw last year, it was like it was a, a totally different nation. Um, even the chance of we got points uh, during the jury voting was, was really lovely to see. I mean, I don't know the inner workings of the broadcaster or the delegation, but I, I personally would attribute a lot of it to somebody called Lee Smithurst within the, the UK delegation. He's been very kind of present and very giving with his time in terms of discussing what's been going on behind the scenes. Um, even within Junior Eurovision, uh, the BBC also took that on um, in the past year and they did incredibly well there and put forward a, a great song. So uh, I think he kind of recognised the, the need for, for a change in direction for the country. And one thing I particularly thought was lovely was I heard a, um, a clip on another podcast called The Eurotrip, where he discussed uh, after 21, where both Spain and the UK suffered dismal results. He um, sat down with the head of delegation from Spain and they essentially promised each other, no, next year, this isn't happening. We are ensuring whatever we do that we put forward the best possible song, the best representation for our countries. And they both secured a, a top three. I mean, that's not going to happen every year, but um, just the both both Spain and the UK, I think are countries we could really be looking at in, in terms of of how they they turn things around, you know. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, and I want to get on actually now to Michael. Um, so Michael, last year, um, in last year's conference, you were discussing about these pre-parties. So Brooke was attending these pre-parties, um, which are essentially like many Eurovision concerts where a few of the acts go, um, not everyone decides to go. But um, last year, you you mentioned that you thought it was a really good idea. Now I've seen Wild Youth have been attending them. How has that experience been this year? I saw that you were at a few of them as well. I saw a few pictures of you attending them. So how have they been? Um, I think that they've been they've been really useful actually for um, Wild Youth because they're a band that thrives off performance. And this really gives them a sort of an insight into, first of all, the whole Eurovision experience because um, these uh, pre-Eurovision events have only gotten bigger over the last number of years. I mean, the one in Madrid there last weekend, there was several thousand people in, in a venue in um, in the centre of Madrid, and uh, that was attended by, you know, 15 or 16 other countries, same as the one in Tel Aviv the previous weekend. Um, and there this weekend, they're in, in um, Amsterdam tomorrow and London, I think, on Sunday. So it's... 
for, for a band like them, I think it's it's really, really important that they get out there and that they get used to um, the crowd and they get used to um, just the, the, the stage experience. Not that they, they're novices at it or anything. Um, so I think that I think those those pre Eurovision events are only going to get bigger. They 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 take an awful lot of work. I mean, like you know, half of my time now is taken up like I'm a, had to be a full time travel agent for them. You know, when it when it gets to these things because they're they're on nearly every weekend. You know, so they're they they take a lot of organising. Um, just a couple of things because I can't. I know Louise and Connor mentioned some things. But I just I, I have to I suppose throw in my 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 tuppence worth on them as well. Um, you mentioned like that the BBC um, had an attitude to change. The BBC have been doing exactly what we've been doing. I mean, they're they're one of the delegations I suppose that I would be closest with, and I know Lee very well, and I know Andrew very well, and we would discuss this on a regular basis, not just during Eurovision time, but outside of Eurovision time as well. Um, they've been doing what we've been doing. They've been trying different methods over the years, you know. And what what the big difference is that uh, well, two things. One is that they got extremely lucky that they got a, an artist like Sam Ryder with a really good song that did really well for them. Um, and that's that's what changed their fortune. You know, I mean, if they came back up with another James Newman and another song that didn't do well, they'd still be in the same position that we are. That's the first thing I'd say about that. The second thing is, let's not forget that the UK and Spain and Italy and France and Germany are automatically in the final. So that makes it uh, first of all, a lot easier for them. And, um, you know, secondly, it puts people like us at an even bigger disadvantage. And if Adrian was asking earlier on about rule changes, what rule change would you like to see? I don't know. I think we should have a look at the automatic inclusion of the big five in the grand final. I know there are reasons why they do it. I mean, they're very, very, you know, clear reasons that if, if, if any of those countries decide to pull out, you, you, you lose funding, you also lose access to a massive audience. But at the same time, it's inherently unfair. Let's not beat around the bush about that. Um, so they're, they're really the only two things I'd say. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're, we're one decent result away from turning this competition around for ourselves. And that is, um, that's, that's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of luck involved in that, I suppose, that we get the right act coming along at the right time. Um, we have to get the right process. That's absolutely true as well. But I mean, we can't be accused of not trying different processes. Like we've, over the last 10 years that I've been involved, we've tried them four or five different methods of doing it, you know? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you, Michael. And that's something actually that myself and Adrian um, were discussing in the class I run with my 310Bs. Um, Ireland have been trying different methods. Um, I think another one we've been talking about is France as well. Every year you see different acts been sent every year, which I think is so yeah. important. And that's that's why, sorry, can interrupt. That's why I think it's unfair to say that the BBC had an attitude change and that's why suddenly their fortunes have turned around. That's absolutely incorrect. Their attitude has always been they want to do the best job possible at any given year. It's the same as ours. So I think that's kind of an unfair way of looking at it, to be honest. No problem. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, Adrian has just uh, messaged me. He has a slide about language use um, at the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, would you like to talk about that now, Adrian? Hi, Keelan. Uh, hopefully people, this is where the fun and games of Zoom kicks in yet again. Uh, I've just a slide here on language use, so hopefully uh, I'll be able to share this properly. I to know this is where I find no one can see it, but anyway. Uh, I think one of the interesting things, and this might be something the panel might like to talk about, is about how countries represent themselves at Eurovision. One of the interesting things I think in the last few years for me has been kind of the return to native languages at Eurovision. Uh, I remember 2016, there was only two songs, three songs in the entire Eurovision that year that had no, that had no English language that didn't involve the English language. Uh, we're now up to around 20% in more recent contests. Uh, I suspect Ukraine 2016 and definitely Portugal 2017, the fact that people saw countries winning at Eurovision again, uh, people saw countries like Ukraine and Serbia not just winning, or, but also doing very well at Eurovision with songs in the native language. Of course, the last two or three years, the top entries have nearly all been entries not in the English language. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, maybe you're, 
maybe I'll go to you, Kim. What do you think on this? And then I'll hand back to the panel. Oh, oh here's, sorry, here's a map showing what parts of Europe are least likely to use English in their songs. And there's a very obvious geography there. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula, France, Italy, and also the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, what's interesting is uh, you tend to get a higher use of non-English, a higher use of languages other than English amongst the big five, because France, Italy, and Spain often tend to use their own language and they don't use English as much as other countries. Anyway, I'll hand over to you, Keelan, and yeah. just hear what the panel yeah. thinks. I won't talk too long about my own opinion on it, um, but um, yeah, because I just think one of the biggest, and Michael, you're definitely sick of hearing this, is that we should send a song in Irish. And I completely agree with that, provided it's the right song. <laughs> like You can't just send any old song um, because I would be a big fan of the Irish language. Um, I did find in the Euro song that when Aji included Irish, I did think it was a little bit just for the sake of it. Like, you know, and I, do, I don't think that sort of attitude. However, in Eurovision, we are seeing more and more countries sending it in not only their native language, but, you know, kind of like more like smaller languages within the country, which I think is really important for culture. I think it's really important um, to um I just think it's very important to be honest with you. Like I think it, it but provided it's the right song. I think last year France, um, they were just in a very tough competition. I think that was it. The standard was very high. I was a big fan of France's entry. They um sang Britannia, uh, probably pronounced that wrong last year, but I, I but I do think um that like you know, that people singing in their native languages are it, it is quite important just for culture, for um, that world stage as such. But um, I think I might pass to Rebecca because we haven't heard you. Uh, but what do you find uh, the with regards to the contest in recent years um, and more and more countries sending songs in their native language? Um, what how, how have you found that, Rebecca? I think it's very easy for the big five when they automatically qualify to have the confidence to present something in their own language and um, because automatically they're in the final. Um, I think as well as well, like the countries that are sending, so like France, um, you know, like singing in, in Breton, you know, that's that's very evocative for you know certain parts of the country. Um, and I think it taps into the minority languages in other countries as well. So I think that's that's you know it's lovely symbolism. Um, I agree that if we're sending something Asquilaga, it can't just be the cringy, you know, Kubla Fucker like we had with Aji's entry. Um I, I loved the song, I thought they did it well, but I just thought um, you know, that doesn't need to be there. Um if yeah i yeah i i'm a big fan of of country singing their own language loved moldova last year because that was still it wasn't it wasn't ballady it was just you know it was upbeat i still listen to it weekly and um, i just think when it all depends on the song irrespective of of the language and um, you know if it evokes um, if it's a ballad and if it evokes you know memories for people even if they don't understand the language like Italy this year um, I've, I've no Italian but it's really emotive um, and Italy just seemed to do that really well but that's because you know they're coming from you know that kind of Latin language and um, if we present a song in Irish and you know um, that if if the ballad or the you know the feeling of it is really emotive I think people get behind it even if they they can't necessarily understand it so potentially something to try down the line for us but as you said earlier it's only if you really get the, the song right we can't just you know throw in something else well, get us for the sake of it. Thanks Rebecca and Connor. just to come to you about that how important do you think your vision is for countries to showcase um, aspects of their culture whether that be their national language or even like you know smaller and um, more minute languages within the country or music um, your vision as a platform in your eyes is it important for that um I, I don't know it really depends on the country you know you're talking about I think the likes of Sweden they don't really care about showcasing Swedish or anything like that they just want to send a good quality song that will do you know the as as good as it can at the contest so 
Um, it really depends on who you're looking at. I, I, I think languages nowadays is something that countries don't really focus on. I think it's simply just the song of what they're they're getting. Um, yeah, yeah, like I, yeah, I just think we've moved on from you know wanting to showcase languages. I think for Ireland though, for Irish, for us, I think it's something that we would love to see. But like Rebecca said, and like Michael said, you have to get the song. You have to get the right song. You can't be just sending Irish for the sake of sending Irish. But we see with Junior last year, we came fourth. You know, it there's potential there. I think if songwriters just see, you know, if you get a good quality song in Irish, you can do well. It's something, you know, Irish isn't seen as something bad at the contest, you know, coming forth in the junior contest. I know it's 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 nothing compared to the main contest, but it just shows you that song quality can come through despite in English, Swedish, whatever it is, just the song quality is the main main thing. Thanks, Connor. Um, so we have a couple of more minutes left in this section before we get on to our famous jukebox jury um, where we discuss our favourite songs. So I just want to go to the Q&A. Um, so I have a question there from Shane Farley. Um, we're going back to the world votes um, because this is a new edition this year with regards to voting. So Shane has asked with the addition of the rest of the world votes, do you think non-European members such as Israel could benefit from non-European cultures getting to vote? So I suppose that goes for Australia as well um, and countries such as that. So I might come to um, Louise with that, if that's OK with you. And um, what do you think, Louise? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it, it will particularly benefit countries who are more on the peripheral of Europe or or outside of Europe, like I, I think most people are tuning in to see an entertainment show and they're going to vote for their favourite song or their their two favourite songs. I mean, I mentioned earlier, like I could maybe see there being more support for a country like Spain from Latin American countries, perhaps, um, you know, or, you know, countries that have cultural ties um, to some, some countries in Europe. But I think there's such a melting pot of countries um and obviously there's so many nations across the world i i don't see it pushing the likes of israel or australia up to the top just simply because they're they're more on the peripheral of europe um or outside of europe per per se you know yeah thanks louise um and then there's another question there from daniel murphy and um, with regards to how acts are chosen and language acts in particular so um, how much of an impact of how acts are chosen in each country, internal selection, public vote slash contest, so the different selection methods that country plays to select acts, would have on language acts chosen to sing in? So I might come to Connor on this. I don't know if you can contribute on this. Have you been keeping up to date with regards to selection methods, um, Connor? Um, and do you think that, um, like, how much of an impact does selection have on? in particular languages um i i don't think there's national finals out there that really you know hammer down on on the language that the song is is chosen i think most countries just go for the best quality song um you know in, in sweden there's not an emphasis on trying to get a swedish song through the national song contest and melody festival but that's not to say that there's no swedish songs in the selection either um i think for us maybe this year the addition of Irish with which Ad, Adi's song might have been a small attempt to try and get a bit of Irish in there. But again, is it something that, you know, broadcasters are focusing deeply on? I don't think so. I think, again, it just comes down to the quality of the song, the quality of the artists. Um, possibly when you go internally, um, potentially there might be, you know, looking at, at languages. But again, I think it just, it, the essence of it simply is the quality of the song, the quality of the artists, the package that they can bring the you know the, maybe the following that the act has and um, you know may muller in the uk this year is probably a good example of that you know she's an upcoming artist she's had a few hits in the us um but you know relatively like sam Ryder, unknown on on the mainstream kind of stage so i think it, it's it, again it's more so the song the quality of the song and and the quality of the act thanks connor um so i think we're our jukebox Jerry, Adrian, um, are you happy to yeah. share this session? Uh, there's been a few more questions coming through, though, Keelan. Uh, Adam said, could more be done to advertise art to artists to enter Eurosong, as it doesn't seem to be covered too much in RT? Uh, Shane asked, do you think the automatic qualification of the likes of the UK 
kind of re resulted in a delayed realization that they needed to switch things up. But I think Michael possibly answered that already. Uh, an interesting question from the other Shane, Shane Farrelly, how much at all do you think marketing of the Eurovision Song Contest can influence the votes through possible, through possibly focusing more on certain countries than others in advertising or social media posts, such as posters or interviews? Uh, yeah, so I might just park those questions here and if any of the panel want to come back to them while they're talking there, uh, but I know we're coming up to the jukebox jury section here. So for this section, uh, I'm just going to go to every panel member and the rules of this section is, and I'm also going to try and see what everyone in the audience thinks as well. So what? So the question I'm going to ask everyone, not just the panel, but everyone in the audience, I'll try and read the comments in the chat as well, just to make sure we hear as many people as possible. So the question is, uh, what are your up to five favorite entries in this year's contest? And briefly, why do you like them so much? I don't want to hear the songs you don't like. And if someone likes a song that you don't like, uh, please don't feel you need to say why that you don't like the song. I just want to hear the songs you like. Uh, and we'll start with Lou on this one, please. Remind me, Adrian, you said five, is it? Up to five, Lou, yeah. Okay. Um, I always find this very difficult, but whittling it down, I just have my ranking in front of me here. Uh, I love the Czech song with uh, Vesna, and I love the rap, and I love the cultural um, influences in the song and the, the folk efforts. I think it's really fantastic. Uh, I really love the United Kingdom song. I think they've done really well. Um, following on from Sam, I mean, um, I know I alluded to earlier, the the attitude changes. Obviously, it still remains to be seen how they're going to do this year, but I think um, there's been such a shift in, in positivity, even uh, for the most part in the media, um, and given they're hosting it as well, it's been great to see. So uh, I think this song is fantastic. It's really radio friendly. May has been brilliant online. So I can't wait to see if they do that live. I love Slovenia, uh, Joker Out. Uh, there's kind of Maniskin influences there and I can see them doing very, very well. I think they're ones to watch in semi too. Austria are fantastic. Uh, who the hell is Edgar? Really clever, really fun. It's going to stand out, I think, uh, especially with a televoting semi-final. And, oh, I'm struggling between the, the Netherlands and Belgium to round off... Um, I'm probably going to go with Belgium, um, Gustav. It's a very fun disco song um, and doesn't take itself too seriously. So I think it's one for Eurovision fans everywhere to enjoy. Okay, thanks, Lou. I see there's some uh, favourites coming from the audience as well. So I, I'll go to between panel and audience for this. Uh, so Conrad, Finland, fusion of heavy metal with Cuban ballroom dancing. Uh, Daniel, who the hell is Edgar? Very catchy, very fun. Nathan, Italy, Finland, Netherlands, Ukraine, and Slovenia. Dennis, Switzerland, very well constructed, profound message. France, Albania, Slovenia. And Conrad's also thrown in uh, Albania, Spain, and Norway. Uh, okay, we'll go to Michael. I don't know how what you can say, Michael, but apart from Ireland, what would be your personal favourites this year? I was going to say, like Father Ted, they, yeah. they're they all lovely exactly, songs. Exactly. No, um, no, I, you know, I really like, because I've seen a good few of them now performing over the last few weeks in, in different um, arenas. And um, I really like the the French song, uh, Evidemment. I, lo I love the Spanish entry as well, Bl um, Blanca Paloma. And um, Czechia as well, I think is is a is a really good is a really good entry. I also like the UK entry actually. I think May Muller's got it's a really good song. I think the jury might be slightly out on how well she can perform it on the night, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, anything can change between now and, and the show, obviously. Um, so they're really my 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 favourites at the moment, I suppose. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, a few other comments coming in from another Michael, Michael Doherty. Belgium is such a bop. Thomas Townsend, Armenia. Declan McCartan, the Netherlands, just very good at what at what they do now. Maria de Sullivan, Latvia, Finland. She thinks Finland will win. Spain, Austria, and Germany. 
Okay, next up on the chopping block from the panel, sorry, uh, next up to give their top five. I'll uh, go over to you, Rebecca, please. Um, so hello, my top five kind of come from semi-final one, which obviously is unfortunate for Ireland that we're in a very strong semi-final. Norway, for me, um, I love it. I just think um, at Madrid, um, she just did a cracking job. Um, I think what the what these like fan parties show is when when you know when the crowd sing your song back to you, that's really when you know that you know um you're you're going to be doing well in the telly vote. Um yeah, so Norway, um Sweden, but not as high up as as I thought it was was going to be. Um definitely in the fan fest in Madrid, she she held her own. Obviously, like it's Lorraine, she can hold her own. Um and yeah, I thought she did a good job without the staging. Um, Austria, love it. It's really catchy. It just goes round and round your head. I think it's going to do really well. Finland, um, again, he's coming across so well in interviews as well. I just think he's so likable and the song is great. And a bizarre one for me, and it's one that I think should do really well, is Portugal. Um, I just love that kind of like Etta James thing at the start. And then it goes into like, you know, this like Dita Von esque thing. Um, I just think stage presence and that will really be interesting on the night. Um, and yeah, they should definitely get out of uh, semi-final one. Um, May Muller, um, I'm I'm not obviously. I know we're not talking about the songs that we don't like. Um, I'm not a big a biggest fan as others, but I do like that kind of Lena satellite thing that she does. That kind of like you know like kind of street speak thing or whatever the kids are calling it these days. But I um, yeah I think yeah that works well. Again, it'll really come down to how she performs it on the night because. Yeah, I, I haven't really heard phenomenal performances of that to date. Um, but yeah, that's my five, all from semi-final one. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, going back to the public, Laura uh, Fitzcharry, I, I don't know if I pronounced your surname right, Laura. Laura's actually got a very interesting series of Eurovision, of Eurovision history videos coming up soon on Eurovision fashion. She's going to look at the history of Eurovision fashion. So, uh I, I'll mention that it's at the end when I tried to advertise uh, the Eurovision podcast and other podcasts that other people in the panel or in the audience are involved, but uh, uh, definitely check that out. I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. Laura says France, Finland, Austria, Norway, and Czechia. And she, answering to a question, she says Eurovillage tickets are on sale at 12 o'clock for anyone going to Liverpool. Uh, Thomas Townsend, his top five predictions, Sweden, Italy, Finland, Greece, and Austria. Adam says Sweden, Moldova, and Slovenia, all different songs, but have a huge who can draw to them. Uh, Thomas says Greece is a very good contemporary song and has a very talented singer. I uh, think this will do well with the young TikTok crowd and juries too. Uh, right, uh, we're going to Connor now, and uh, I know we're, we're into the last 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, for the panel, try to get them in the next minute or so, and I'll try to get to ma as many as possible, and keep coming in with your chats as well. And as well, Keelan will remind me if I forget this, I'm going to advertise some of the different Eurovision related podcasts, uh, TikTok, social media accounts, that people in the audience and the panel are involved in. So, sorry, Connor, eventually over to you. Uh, it, it's such a hard choice uh, to pick from. I think this year is a really high standard, but I think at the moment, I think Lithuania is a fave of mine. I think um, Shuto Tuto, the kind of hook that she has in the middle of stay is a really, really nice hook and it's playing on my mind all the time. I love it. Um, I think Belgium, again, Gustav, uh, <laughs> because of you, is such a bop. I was in uh, Barcelona for it and the crowd just went crazy for it. The acts went crazy for it. So I think that is a potential kind of um wild card or one to watch potentially for the top 10 i think that will surprise a lot of people uh in may I, i'm loving france as well like michael uh via the mont is is, is kind of so catchy and the beat of it gets you going so um i'm looking forward to to that and as, as well the two kind of favorites at the moment finland and sweden um cha 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 for the kind of chaos that it is i think the staging is is great clean it up a bit from the national final and i think it's one to watch and of course sweden Loreen, I think it's hard not to see how she how she can't be a contender for May. Uh, she's a phenomenal vocalist. Staging, of course, is going to change uh, from what we saw at Melody Festival because you know they can't do what they, what they did um, in Sweden. So be interested to see. But 
again, Eurovision brings up surprises. So, you know, there could be one that we're not talking about at all. And all our rankings could change when it comes to we see staging and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Connor. Uh, just to note, uh, coming back to uh, Laura's website, it's called seekthehistoric.com and our TikTok is Seek the Historic. And while Connor's there, you've got a podcast yourself and you were involved in uh, uh, Aerovision. Would you mind giving a quick minute there, Connor, to tell people how they can find uh, your podcast and what it's all about? Yeah, so the Eurovision podcast is basically a unique Irish perspective on the Eurovision Song Contest. That's our kind of slogan that we that we go for. Um, and yeah, we're we're on all the kind of main podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, we also have a few bits on YouTube, uh, some interviews that we did at Eurosong, and um, also some little fun bits that we did at the Barcelona pre-party as well. And um, we'll have some bits from London as well. We're heading to that this weekend as well. So um, we're kind of sp- spotted around everywhere at the moment. So. I think the main thing, if people head to our socials, just search Airvision Podcast and you should find us. Um, and yeah. Thanks, Connor. Uh, a really interesting question here came in from Declan McCartan. If Ireland was to win Eurovision, what slogan would you choose for an Irish hosted Eurovision Song Contest? You know what, Keelan? I'm going to throw to you first there. For flip's sake, Adrian, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> he knows I'm bad at things like this. I don't know. Um, I would have to be something. That'd be a good slogan. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't. What would be a good one? Um, I suppose. You see, I think the thing is, the flo- uh, slogans. Um, they do have to spark some togetherness. And to be honest with you, every year, like this is how bad I am. Every year that they come up with new slogans, I'm like, how do they do it? I, I honestly don't know. How have they not run out of slogans to come out with? Um. So for me, I would probably go the Irish route just to, I don't know, bring it in. I would probably do something that, and now my Irish isn't as great as it once was, but um, I probably would do something like that. But um, what would you have, Adrian? You'd be more wittier than me, you see. Uh, I'd love to give my opinion, but I can see Lou is giant coming with that question <laughs> there. So I hand over to Lou. <laughs> Coughing out, that's what you're doing, Adrian. <laughs> Connor knows that I do this all the time. I'll think of something in my head and I'll start laughing at my own joke. Um, I was just thinking it would be so Irish for it to be like Asher be grand do you know hey. something like that <laughs> but um, on more of a serious note our own, I, I have a huge um, love for our only Irish language entry Kill and Graw back in the 70s so something like that it could be love for music or something um, or Kill and Graw I think that would be lovely Any uh, opinions yourself Michael there because you might have a big say in this if we won Eurovision this year I was just thinking maybe a slogan like about time might be um, appropriate, but uh, no, I don't know. It's it's a hard one because it's it's you have to have something that's that's you know has a universal meaning, that's simple, that's easily grasped, that's you know that's um, and that's in keeping with obviously with the with the the concept of the event. So I don't know. I don't know. I like the Irish. I think something Irish definitely something we should we should include something Irish in it. Um, so I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. I, luckily enough, I don't think we'll have to think about it um, in the in you know next few uh, years. Well, maybe we will. Hopefully we will. Thanks, Michael. Uh, a question uh, from Daniel Murphy to everyone: Would bringing back the native language rule be better if it was modified to be over a certain time period? Say, one entry over a three or five year period must be in the native language. Uh, I know we're going back to what we discussed earlier. Anyone got any strong opinions on that? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a bit mixed. I like the fact that we have sounds in the native language, but I don't like the fact that up to 1999, people were forced to sing in a certain language. I think in fairness, it did give certain countries, <clears throat> Ireland, a bit of an advantage up to that point in time. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, we probably discussed that quite a bit uh i I think it's down to the song you know i mean i think it's the quality of the song has to be paramount i mean that's the the final thing i don't think we should be engaged in any kind of tokenism yeah you know with regards to the irish language and i think it just depends you know i mean i would love nothing better than you know a, a song in the irish language that that was universally appealing you know yeah and i think 
a lot of countries are quite good at actually managing to convey what their songs about, even if it's in their own native. I think Serbia last year uh, was so out there, but it really, the really, it was really a great effort to kind of convey the message of the song without, even though most people in Europe wouldn't have understood the lyrics, apart from Meghan Markle, of course. Uh, okay, everyone, it's two minutes to 10. Uh, I'm going to go to every member of the panel just before we close off and ask them, what would, what would you really like to see at Eurovision this year? What's the one thing you would like to see happen at Eurovision this year? Uh, so we'll start with, uh, we'll go, uh, we'll start with Connor, Rebecca, uh, Michael Liu, Keelan, and then we'll close off then. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the chats if there's any last minute comments from the chats. So uh, I think, uh, oh yeah, Rebecca, sorry. Well, what I like to see at Eurovision this year. Yeah. Uh, Norway win. Okay, that's very uh, really good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Norway's in my top five as well, to be honest, along with Georgia and Moldova. So thanks for that, Rebecca. Uh, Lou, uh, what would you like to see at Eurovision this year? Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be going, um, and Connor as well. So just uh, like the full itinerary looks brilliant. So I think just um, good vibes, good atmosphere, good representation of Ukrainian culture. I also would like to see an open competition it has been feeling a little bit like a two horse race um with the talk around Finland and Sweden and the competition is always more exciting when there's um different countries being talked about so I would like a few surprise results a few surprise qualifiers a few surprise top tens just to keep it interesting keep it open excellent uh thanks Lou uh Dennis in the chat has suggested Frankie goes to Hollywood as an interval act Nathan says he would just love to see Ireland in the grand final uh, Michael, what would you like to see apart from Ireland in the grand final? Well, that's the main thing as yeah. far as I'm concerned. I uh, just want to see Wild Youth in the, in the grand final. I think that would give um, the grand final just uh, and the, the RT1 audience, television audience, just something to, um, you know, a stake in the competition, which we haven't had for a few years. So that's absolutely the main thing. I mean, uh, beyond that, um, what would I like to see? Frankie goes to Hollywood, you know, maybe I'm a, I'm a kind of a child of the 80s myself, so I would love uh, that. Our, uh, Liverpool is, was home to many a great band, you know, from um, from the uh, from from the 80s, the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. So, uh, yes, unusual interval acts would be great. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. And last, before I go to Keelan, Connor, uh, we're at 11 o'clock, so very quickly, what is there any one thing you'd like to see at Eurovision this year? I, I think the main thing is Ireland in the grand final. Um, I'll be at the semi-final on the, on the Tuesday night, so I want to be leaving the arena, waving my tricolour with happy tears and everything like that. So I think the main thing for me is Ireland in the grand final and hopefully the start of, of, a, of the next chapter for us at, at the Eurovision Song Contest. Can I just say, just to add, Adrian, sorry, really quickly, and I hate to monopolise anybody at time here, but I think Ireland in the grand final would do wonders for us as um, uh, just a, for the perception of the competition in Ireland here. And it also would certainly help the case towards a standalone um, selection process, which I've been banging a big drum about here for a long, long time. And I think that's what we need. If we want to develop and um, you know improve our chances going forward, I think that's one of the key things we need to do. Thanks, Michael. Uh, okay, so we're actually two minutes past 11. So I'm going to hand over to Keelan to round up and thank all our panelists. So uh, before I hand over to Keelan, I just thank everyone who's taken the time to listen in today. Uh, and I'll hand over to Keelan to thank all our panelists now and wish you all uh, good night from Minute. Thanks so much, Adrian. So firstly, um, I want to thank all our panellists for today. So thank you so much to Lou and Connor um, from uh, Airvision podcast. Make sure to check that out. I do think that podcast, because earlier on, they did mention that there was a gap there. And I think people like Lou and Connor are very important for momentum 
within um, a country for Eurovision. And it could be something that could help us um, to progress Eurovision in Ireland a bit further as well. Um, I do think it's very important. So do check out their podcast um, and check out their Twitters as well because they're excellent. They, uh, I've been very busy the past few months and I must thank you. You have kept me up to date with Eurovision the past few months and I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you again to Michael as well. As always, fascinating conversations keep up the good work I think changes are happening with the Eurovision in Ireland and I'm hoping to God that Wild Juice gets through and um, I think they thrive on performance on um, performing they were excellent at Euro song and um, the the song itself wasn't my favorite going into your song but I must say they were the deserved winners like I was very it was a toss-up between them and Connolly for me so I think they could perform excellently and I really hope they get through um, because they are talented fellas. Um, thank you again, Rebecca, as well. As always, and I, I just love talking to Rebecca because you're just um, you're just a, a fan of the Eurovision Song Contest. So thank you so much for joining us um, as well. And thank you as well to Johnny Fallon, who um, is excellent uh, on his takes. Thank you so much, Adrian, for organising this. Um, he did the bulk of the work. Um, so thank you so, so much, Adrian. Um, and thank you very much to Mossy, particularly Anne. And Mossy, without her, we wouldn't have been able to actually get this going um she she really has um she really has uh, broadened our horizons with this conference by putting it online hasn't she adrian um yeah, definitely yeah. yeah uh i definitely agree without Anne, uh i would say most people here today wouldn't have been able to take part so really okay. really a big thank you to Anne and to everyone in the minute university social sciences institute uh, just before I mention Keelan, just to say that this is actually one of the events. Today is the European Night of Jarvi. So this is one of the official Geo Night events, even though it's on first thing in the morning. But hey, I go to sleep very early. Uh, thanks to Keelan for all her work in uh, with this year's conference and indeed the last few years. And thanks to Keelan for taking the fort when somebody <clears throat> accidentally uninstalled Zoom two minutes into the conference. Uh, uh, so thanks to, and again, thanks to all our wonderful panelists uh, this year. Thanks very much to our debut panelist, Connor, to Michael, as always, for who's very generous with his time, uh, to Lou, uh, to Rebecca, and to Johnny. I think I've mentioned everyone there. And of course, again, thanks to Keelan. Uh, so that's it for us for this year. Hopefully, we'll all see you, whether in person or in cyberspace again next year. But thanks everyone, and I hope you enjoyed the next few weeks and of your vision stuff. And thanks to everyone who posted thanks in the comments. So uh, from Rebecca, from Lou, from Michael, from Connor and Keelan and Anne and myself, thanks very much everyone for joining in. Uh, Sloan, Gofol, and goodbye from us here in Minute. Thanks very much. <laughs>